I would like to share with you today something that I've been researching and thinking about for quite some time now, and that's compassion. Now, these days, compassion gets quite a hard time. As we look around our world, we see that walls are being built, nations are increasingly divided, and the fear of the other, the stranger, the different, is rife. It's at times like these that we need compassion more than ever. And yet, compassion has a bit of a reputation problem. It has a reputation for being weak, soft, and fluffy. And Nietzsche even said that compassion was one of the worst epidemics facing humankind. Today, I'd like to argue a different case, that compassion is a powerful choice one which is measurably good for us, and that it's a practice, a practice perhaps that we need now more than ever. And I'll back all of this up with science as I go. So let's start with that powerful choice. Now, it's much easier to make compassion our powerful choice if we understand what compassion actually is. It's usually thought of as being made up of three parts. Noticing someone's suffering, two, feeling an emotional response to that suffering, and three, taking some action to alleviate the suffering. That makes sense, right? Because if we don't notice, then we're not likely to do anything useful because we haven't noticed. If we don't have any feeling, then we're going to be robotic or uncaring in our response. And if we don't do anything, well, that's empathy, not compassion. Because you see, empathy plus action equals compassion. Now, this difference between um, empathy and compassion is pretty key to making a powerful choice, so allow me to explain it a little more. Imagine it's a cold, dark Friday night, and you're at home with your family watching television. There's a charity fundraiser on TV, and they show um, those short films of people in need. Pretty hard to watch sometimes, right? People are suffering, it's pretty awful. Something should be done. But if all you do is watch and feel sorry for people, that's empathy. If, however, you take some action, and, and whether it's phone up and make a donation or commit to running a marathon for charity, that action is what turns the empathy into compassion. Is this just semantics? No. Here's your first bit of science. A 2014 study looked at the different neural networks which were activated in the brain during compassion training, shown here in red, and empathy training, shown here in blue. You don't have to be a neuroscientist to be able to see that they're doing different things in different parts of the brain. But the really exciting thing about this research is that the areas that were working during compassion training are those that are traditionally associated with positive emotions. Things like love, positive effect, resilience, the, the things that are good for us in times of stress. By comparison, the blue areas, which are those which are associated with empathy training, were much more associated with things like stress and withdrawal. Empathy fatigue, if you like. So you see, choosing compassion over empathy is good for you, and your brain likes it. So this definition of compassion with noticing, feeling, and taking some action is useful up to a point. But I think there's a very important part of the pie which is missing. And it's something that can upgrade our compassion into something far, far more powerful. And it's what I like to call the checking step. So just like on a flight, fit your own mask first before helping others, Check your resources. And consider this. Are you genuinely taking some action in order to try to alleviate the other person's pain? Or are you charging in on your white speed trying to look good? Check your intention. So we can see then that compassion is a powerful choice. That when we choose to take action in a considered and well-resourced way, can make a real difference for people. And that brings me on to my second point, 
which is that compassion is good for us. And I'm not the first Scot who thinks so. Adam Smith, the father of modern capitalism. Now, I'm aware that Adam Smith might seem a little out of place when we're considering compassion. After all, didn't he write about productivity and division of labor? Well, yes, he did. But before he wrote Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith wrote another book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And on the very first page of that book, he talks about compassion. And I've written down what he said because I want to make sure I get it absolutely right. Here's what Adam Smith said. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him. Of this kind is compassion. Fortune of others, their happiness, compassion. So even back in the 1750s, Adam Smith understood that being compassionate was a really important part of being human. And so far, modern science agrees with him. Compassion training has been um, shown to, have, to lower levels of cellular inflammation. What does that mean? Well, high levels of cellular inflammation are correlated to a number of diseases, including some cancers, and they're typically found in people who have high levels of stress. Compassion training lowers these levels of cellular inflammation. So bluntly, compassion is good for us, even at the level of an individual cell. Other research has shown that compassion lowers levels of anxiety and depression. And more than this, compassion has also been shown to increase our social connectedness. That might sound a little obvious, being compassionate is going to increase your social connectedness. But think about this for a moment. A lack of social connectedness is actually considered more detrimental to your individual health than obesity, heart disease, even smoking. And on top of all of this, when we're compassionate towards someone, not only do they get a hit of dopamine, but so do we. And dopamine, that happiest of neurotransmitters, is good for us for quite a number of reasons. It increases our memory, it increases our focus, it can even improve our bone density. There are other better known sources of dopamine, things like chocolate cake or sex. So for dopamine highs and the better world, remember chocolate cake, sex, and of course, compassion. I'll let you choose the order. And compassion isn't just good for us as individuals. It's also really good for organizations. Some of my own research has demonstrated statistically very highly significant levels of correlation between how compassionate people believe their organizations to be and something called effective commitment. Effective commitment results in things like lower staff turnover rates, um, improved job satisfaction, even in improved job performance, Three pretty important elements for a well-run organization, wouldn't you say? So we now understand that compassion is a powerful choice and also that it's good for us as individuals and in organizations. Great. Let's have more compassion. And that brings me on to my third and final point, which is that compassion is a practice. Now, by practice, I don't mean you have to do any radical grand gestures. There's no need to shave your head and go and live on top of a mountain simply mean taking the opportunity to practice compassion wherever you see a need and when you're well resourced to do so. And if you look around, I'm pretty sure you'll find lots of little opportunities to practice. For example, when we're at a supermarket, it's so easy to focus on our list, to rush around and make sure we've got everything we need get through the checkout and get on. In this example here, could you spare a couple of seconds? Can you tie shoelaces? Great, you're resourced and you have everything you need to make a difference. When we're at the train station, 
Do we look up from our phones for long enough to even notice someone else's need? This gentleman has. And the resources which he has to offer this lady are very simply some comparative strength, a little of his time, and a smile. Now, I'm not saying that choosing to be compassionate is always easy. I know that sometimes it's the hardest thing to do, although that's when your practice will get really, really deep. But as these examples have shown, sometimes it's the smallest things which make the biggest difference. Howard Zinn said, small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform our world. We have an opportunity in these times of division and uncertainty to choose compassion to transform our world. It's powerful, it's good for us, and all it takes is a little practice. Thank you.